We're going to dig into cost segregation analysis and analyzing some beach properties. And then this is the kind of hotel hub. Joel Farrell here, your host. I've got an amazing guest on today with us, Jeff Badu. Basically, cost segregation in, sim in um, simplistic format. Um, somebody, myself, um, I like to keep things very, very simple. And so basically, the way that I would describe cost segregation is the ability to gain a tax deduction for the accelerated or increased depreciation on a rental property. So typically, when you have a rental property, let's say a residential rental property, um, you would take a tax deduction of basically the purchase price, and usually you subtract out the land, um, divided by 27.5 years, and that usually gets you your annual depreciation deduction amount. And depreciation is an, an expense of the property, basically, um, of the purchase price of the property that you can claim each year that helps offset the, um, the income and expenses of the property or the profit of the property, at least on paper. And depending on what you are, depending on your status, you can actually get a, what we call a, um, you know, basically a tax deduction against your other source of income. You know, if you're known as what we call a real estate professional, but basically cost segregation allows you to accelerate that depreciation by taking the purchase price, to, um, and we use an acceleration rate. And typically for 2024, right, we're looking at anywhere between 10 to 15%. So in a nutshell, if you have a million dollar property and you do a cost segregation analysis or study on it, then you should expect a tax deduction of at least $150,000 that can help offset other sources of income such as W-2 income. Okay, so I want to back up a little bit. So if you're not a real estate investor uh, or, the, or the real estate uh, classification to do cost segregation, what, what are the limits that are applied in terms of the of allowing depreciation deductions? Yeah, so I'll just keep it simple, right? I'm, I'm a big proponent of keeping things simple. So basically, in terms of if you have a beach property, let's say Airbnb, right? let's just call it Airbnb property, and Basically, you're you're sort of always going to be eligible for the deduction um, because at that point it's considered an active investment, an active property. And so, when you have an Airbnb, a beach property, um, basically what you're allowed to do is claim it as active. And when you claim it as active, that allows you to utilize the depreciation in full without needing to be like a, a typical real estate investor. You know, somebody who does 750 or more hours in real estate throughout the year, call it a real estate agent, real estate investor, contractor, a flipper, right? Um, you know, owner operator, right? So basically you don't have to meet those qualifications in this scenario um, if you have a, a beach property like an Airbnb property, essentially. Okay, so the allowable opportunities if you're a real estate agent and have your license, allows you to be able to capitalize on this. If you spend 750 hours, so what's the math on that per day? Two hours a day, something like that? Yeah, so I mean, if we take, um, let's just pull out a calculator here, right? We do 750 divided by 365 days a year. That's two hours a day, exactly. So literally just spending two hours a day, of course, some people don't work weekends. Um, so give or take two to three hours a day. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all you're all you're doing in real estate throughout the year, okay. basically. Okay. So for the proper channels to be able to document that, what's what's one tip of advice that you would give to somebody? It, it, and this this applies for a long term rental type of stuff. Uh, right. How do people document that? It's as easy as a spreadsheet. Just an Excel spreadsheet tracking the date. Um, basically, the date right? you want to put um, the date that you did the activity. Um, basically, what did you do for the activity? Maybe you went out to look at real estate, for example, with your account. Um, you did some bookkeeping on your real estate. You met with your property management team, right? So pretty much anything you went out to, you know, meet with your lender to talk about real estate, talk about the deal, do some analysis. So basically, I usually recommend an Excel log, like a spreadsheet that has the date, 
Um, and then pretty much um, the activity, right? What did you do? It can be very basic, just you know, a few, few words, few sentences. And then um, how much time you spent, right? So you spent an hour, you spent two hours. And yeah, that's it. Okay, so I want to back up. So let's say that I've got a million dollars of real estate mm -hmm. across a couple properties. And if I don't use this tax strategy, we're accelerating the depreciation. Then if I'm if I'm right on this, so 27 and a half years, spread that over time. So in that first year, you know, you're going to have a limited amount of depreciation that you can collect or uh, uh, expense on that first year, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So in this strategy, you can accelerate that in the first couple of years or what's the... What's the, the cadence of how the strategy works? Yeah, it's basically one year. It's a one year acceleration. Um, so put it in very simple, very simple terms. Take the purchase price, multiply it by 15%, and that can get you a reasonable amount of how much you can claim as um, depreciation expense. Accelerate depreciation, assuming you went through the proper channels of doing a cost segregation study with an actual professional cost segregation team. Yeah, I guess for one year. Um, we have one question from the the, the crowd here. So Absolutely. the that fifteen percent that's just for the first year, right? Correct. The fifteen percent would be for first year. So um, twenty twenty four, for example, you bought the property, um, and it, and it's based on the date you placed the property in service, meaning when you started renting it out to other people. So you could have bought a property a hundred years ago, and you just started renting it out today then you would apply 2024 rules to that. And so basically with that being said, uh, what we would do is take the purchase price multiplied by 15%, that's your year one acceleration um, rate. So million dollars times 15%, 150,000. You take the remaining 850,000 and you spread it out over the next 26 and a half years because it's, typical, it's typically 27 and a half years. So you would take away a year um, from that. Okay, before we dig into some of these examples, because we, you know, we're sitting here at the Soba House in Rosemary Beach at a podcast, Swiss Army Knife area, and um, this overlooks this corridor, um, and, and down the way here, you've got some homes that are $19 million, $60 million, $8 million. So this is a unique area of the Emerald Coast and the Panhandle of Florida in between Destin and Panama City on 30A. And... The people that are buying properties in this area, you know, you're talking about the average, you know, somewhere in the, the 1.5 to $3 million range, depending on the, the specific, you know, city, Seaside, mm -hmm. Rosemary, Water Sound, Alice Beach, uh, Sea Grove. There's 13 to 14 different communities here. So we're going to dig into two properties. One is a single family house. One's a condo in the $5 million range. Um, and these are both going to be, you know, with water views. So we're going to take some real examples of some listings in the market. So bonus depreciation uh, and the trend. So this has been the bonus depreciation has been phased out uh, over time. So uh, what are the what are the numbers been look like in the last couple of years um, for investors? Yeah, that's a great question. So basically, in terms of bonus depreciation, um, so it all really. I mean, this has been around for a very long time, but it really got jack. You know, it really got amped up when Trump got into office. So back in 2017, they signed a track, um, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act by the Trump administration. And that now allows us to claim bonus depreciation um, on rental properties, right? Never really before could you do a full year bonus accelerated depreciation on a rental property where you can claim the full benefit in one year, basically. You had to spread it out over five years, seven years, 15 years, depending on what the specific item was. And so basically in 2017, they said, hey, if you place a property in service, let's call it you know, in Q4 2017 and after, then you're basically able to claim bonus depreciation on rentals, right? So between 20, let's call it Q4 2017, and 2022, you were able to do 100%. So basically what that means is that in that million dollar property example, it would, it would have been 25% in 
right? 25% and so a $250,000 tax deduction on a million dollar property. If you place it in service between Q4 2017 and 2022, and in 2023, the year that we're filing taxes for now, um, the rate basically dropped to, you know, let's call it basically um, 20%. Right, so 20%. And so now we're looking at about a 20% um, acceleration rate for 20, 2023, right? So if you bought a rental property in 2023 or you place it in service in 2023, remember it's always based on when you place it in service. When did you get tenants? When did you start claiming it on your tax returns, right? So um, basically the rate, the acceleration rate has gone down by um, a five percentage point each year. So 2022, 25%, 2023, 20%, 2024, 15%. And this is assuming you're doing a full-blown cost segregation study, right? Um, there are some folks that may sort of do their own like study. You know, maybe they don't use a, a professional or a CPA firm or anything like that. So they may get lower rates because they're not doing a full-blown where a team goes out, looks at the property, looks at the components, you know, cabinets, flooring, roof, all that stuff. So basically, it's it's scaled down by pretty much 5%. Um, so 25%, 20%, um, 15%. Um, so right now, we're looking at 15%. Now, here's the thing, right? This is not a political stance or anything like that. But if Trump gets back in office, which appears to be most likely um, to happen, right, during the elections this year, in November or so, then uh, what will most likely happen is he's going to renew everything. And so we'll be back up to the 25% um, instead of the 15% that we are currently. 